a Caribbean island paradise and a volcano that wakes after lying dormant for centuries. Ten and a half thousand lives are at stake. Volcanologists rush to the sea. Then, a catastrophic eruption sends an avalanche of red-hot rock and ash down the mountain. In the chaos, no one knows how many are dead or why the volcano takes the islanders by surprise. One man predicted this disaster. But why wasn't he listened to? Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Eastern Caribbean, the island of Montserrat. This tiny island is one of the last remaining outposts of the British Empire. It's 10 miles long and six miles wide, more than twice the size of Manhattan. It's a haven for the rich and famous and home to many recording studios used by well-known musicians. The island is celebrated for its natural beauty and tranquil, easy-going lifestyle. 80% of the island's infrastructure lies in the shadow of Soufriere Hills, a mountain 3,000 feet above sea level that dominates the southern half of the island. Most of the population live and work in the capital, Plymouth, or farm the rich, fertile soil along the mountain. On the northern side lies the village of Farrell's Yard, home to Delia Pond. It is a paradise, and because everybody is so friendly towards one another, we never have a cave in the world. I guess we are brought up in a way to accept life for what it is. A mother of six, Delia has lived on Montserrat her entire life. She rents a small plot of land where she grows vegetables to sell on neighboring islands. David Lee is an American missionary who has lived on Montserrat for 15 years. He's also an amateur cameraman and has filmed everything from carnivals to local sporting events. It's off the beaten paths. It's the way the Caribbean used to be. The people are genuinely friendly. And we came for a month and checked it out. And it was just like they said, and we, we never left. But a hidden menace is beneath this tropical garden of Eden. The lush vegetation and productive soil relies a lethal reality. The island is volcanic. Montserrat sits directly on a geological subduction zone one of the most seismically active parts of the planet's crust. The North Atlantic tectonic plate, moving westward, sinks beneath the Caribbean plate. As it descends, it melts and forms magma, which over time finds its way to the Earth's surface, creating a string of volcanic islands known as the Lesser Antilles. But Montserrat has shown no signs of major volcanic activity for approximately 370 years. The only evidence of volcanicity are springs hot enough to boil an egg, sprouting from the slopes of Soufriere Hills. Then, on July 18, 1995, everything changes. The islanders hear a deafening noise, similar to the sound of a jet engine coming from the mountain. Leroy Slim Daly, a local farmer and part-time cab driver, is in Plymouth that day. People started to realize that there was something happening in the mountains. Most people thought it was a plane, a jet which was passing, but the sound just didn't go away. Over the next week, the volcano continues to rumble. Ten and a half thousand people now face a threat they never expected. For David Lee, it's a chance to film a much more dramatic subject. 
I decided to document the volcano because I had just taken a sabbatical. Uh, we'd been really busy with a lot of things for about 10 years, so I had nothing else to do. I had a nice little camera. The volcano started to erupt. Little did I know that would turn into a uh, vocation. As news of the volcanic activity spreads worldwide, scientists arrive on the island. The event provides them with a unique opportunity to observe a volcano returning to life after centuries of dormancy. Among them is a recent graduate from Indiana State University, volcanologist Rob Watts. He regards the trip as the opportunity of a lifetime. My dream job is to monitor a volcano, to see a volcano in action, and just incredible, his nature at work. Scientists set up a temporary observatory and install nine seismometers that record time, duration, and intensity of earthquakes. The deafening sound being monitored is called a phreatic eruption, coming from part of an old crater known as Castle Peak. Groundwater heated by magma rising deep inside the volcano evaporates, building a massive head of steam that bursts through fractures in the rock. The team watches and waits for the volcano to come back to life. A month after the initial activity, David Lee climbs to the western edge of the crater, overlooking Castle Peak. Anybody watching this? Don't be stupid enough to come up here. As I began to walk up to the crater edge, I started to roll the camera. The whole mountain is quivering. It's spewing right now. As I walked out through what was then rainforest, here was this phreatic eruption taking place, and it was just like unbelievable, and stones and pebbles were falling, and it was roaring. I had no idea if the whole mountain could blow up. There's no doubt that down below there is magma that wants to come out. Then the volcano emits another deafening blast. I turned and started to hightail down the mountain. Okay, Lord. Put my trust and faith in you. You're my refuge and strength in every trouble. That was my last trip up there, folks. David's adopted home has revealed a new and dangerous character. Do I look scared? <laughs> Let me take it and put it on auto. Now do I look scared? I'm not out of here yet. I'm only down about 600 feet. If the whole thing went, wouldn't have a chance up here. I, uh, the whole top of the mountain was just shivering, 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 up and down under your feet. And you could feel this awesome power underneath vibrating, wanting to come out. A massive eruption is on the horizon, and it's one that will take the islanders by surprise. Seconds from disaster will return in a moment. Stopping. It's not that hard. And only Allstate pays you an extra bonus to do it. Get one of these every six months you go without an accident. Can you afford not to be in good hands? This is the way Afrin gets rid of your congestion. You're like this. You use Afrin once? And you're like this all day. Nothing relieves congestion better. So why suffer? When there's the 12-hour relief of Afrin. Ah, maze. The sun used to make our outdoor deck and patio space so hot and uncomfortable, we couldn't use it. But then we discovered the Sunsetter Retractable Awning. Our Sunsetter Retractable Awning opens and closes in just 60 seconds. It keeps our patio about 20 degrees cooler. It provides instant shade and instant protection from the sun's harmful rays. And our Sunsetter costs under $700. But now you can get your Sunsetter for as little as $398 when you call now to get this special $200 discount certificate. We love our Sunsetter Retractable Awning and you're going to love yours too. It transforms your outdoors from sweltering sun to shady oasis in only seconds. Call now for this free awning idea kit packed with great awning solutions that will let you enjoy your deck or patio much more often this summer. 
Plus, get this $200 discount certificate that will bring you your Sunsetter for as little as $398. But this is a limited time offer. Call now. Sunsetter retractable awnings are assembled in America and are guaranteed to last for years. And talk about extras. You can choose from motorized awnings for push button opening and closing or choose screened in models for bug free outdoor living all for just a bit more. No wonder Sunsetter is America's best selling retractable awning. Call now to get the whole Sunsetter story. You'll get this free awning idea kit with DVD plus a $200 discount certificate and there's no obligation. Hundreds of thousands of families own and love their Sunsetter retractable awnings. We're one of them and you should be too. Stay cooler and enjoy your Decker patio much more often. And do it all at $200 off if you call now. Call now for your free awning idea kit with DVD and $200 discount certificate. Life is better under a Sunsetter. Call now and save. Call 1-800-906-6044. 1-800-906-6044. On Sunday, January 20th, Dr. Brady Barr enters the world of the hippo. This is a really, really dangerous animal. By becoming one. I think I'm going to have my hands full. Of and he'll do it in a 200-pound hippo suit. I'm going to get inside the suit and approach them. In the middle of a swamp. He's looking right at me. At night. No, no, no. This is killing me. Dangerous Encounters Undercover Hippo premieres Sunday, January 20th at 9 on Nat Geo. Sunday, January 13th, they're the newbies and fitting in. We'll get you, boy. We'll get you. Isn't easy. But before they're locked up, someone has to catch them. Bounty Hunters. It's a high stakes game of hide and seek. It all starts Sunday, January 13th at 9 with premieres of Lockdown, First Timers, followed by Bounty Hunters, Cat and Mouse at 10, only on Nat Geo. We now return to Seconds from Disaster. Deep within the Sioux Free Air Hills volcano on the island of Montserrat, red hot lava is rising rapidly. But scientists are unsure whether the volcano is entering another dangerous phase of activity. A month after the first blast, another large phreatic eruption fires a cloud of ash, mud, and steam into the air. The vibration rocks Montserrat. The locals stare nervously at the darkening skies as the southern part of the island is showered in a thick cloud of volcanic dust. Thirty minutes later, the billowing pall of gray ash clears. And as the sun breaks through, it reveals an uncanny scene. The capital, Plymouth, and everything west of Sioux Friere Hills is covered in a dense layer of ash. The locals christen the day Ash Monday. Fearing the next eruption could be worse, the Montserratian government and the British military evacuate 6,000 people from their homes on the slopes of the mountain. Plymouth and the surrounding village is empty as the islanders journey five miles to the hastily organized shelters in the northern part of the island. But the exodus creates chaos. The north is underdeveloped. Living conditions are basic and eventually become squalid. We were housed in schools and churches. You had uh, like 40 to 50 people to a church. You have the young, the old, the Christian, the drunkard, um, the infant, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The islanders are desperate to return home. With 80% of Montserrat's infrastructure in the south, many are granted access during the day in order to keep the island functioning. Delia Pond's produce is now a vital resource for the islanders camped in the north. She and her family tend to a plot of land within easy sight of the volcano summit. Each day they take precautions in case of another eruption. Whenever we get to the farm in the morning, we always turn the vehicle facing towards the, the, the road and we always leave the keys in the car in case of emergency. So we just get in and take off. Their planned escape route takes them north to the sanctuary of a small hill. 
on the slopes above Delia's plot, another farmer, Harry Lewis, rents several acres. He and his wife prepare and plant the land. Like Delia, it's their only livelihood. By September, the islanders return home to see a new site on the horizon. A large mound of rock and ash is growing on the summit of the volcano. This bizarre development confirms the scientists' worst fears. It's known as a lava dome, an unstable bulbous mass formed by successive deposits of thick, viscous lava. If the sides of this lava dome collapse, a deadly mixture of red-hot rock and ash will cascade down the mountainside in what's called a pyroclastic flow. These lethal avalanches can travel at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. Temperatures at their core can reach over 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. They've caused over 40,000 deaths in the last century alone and are responsible for some of the most deadly disasters in recorded history. It was a pyroclastic flow that incinerated over 28,000 people on the Caribbean island of Martinique in 1902 and 2,000 inhabitants of Pompeii in 79 AD. Faced with this threat, the islanders return north. Rob Watts and the scientists keep an eye on the lava dome. While I was measuring, I could sit and watch the dome and watch the activity, you know, watch big rock fall spall away from the dome. I just became fascinated with the whole way it was growing. But five months after Soufriere Hills first erupted, the growth of the lava dome slows, quieting the volcanic activity. The government allows the evacuees to return to their homes once again. And normal life on the island resumes. But the volcano isn't finished yet. Nearly three months later, it fires its first pyroclastic flow down the eastern slope of the mountain, heading for the coastline. The flow travels for over a mile. No one is hurt but it's clear that the volcanic activity is intensifying. Again, the government orders an evacuation for the northern part of the island. But the constant coming and going creates confusion and anger among the evacuees. An exclusion zone is established in the south of the island. Everything south of Plymouth and west of the airport is restricted. But the threat level of the volcano is still unclear, and roadblocks aren't strictly enforced. The islanders still come and go. Local filmmaker David Lee heads inside the exclusion zone to document the events. I figured I was doing all the right things, that I understood what was happening on the volcano, and that I knew the best and safest places to be. And I would, you know, one way or another, sneak around the checkpoint to be able to get some of the images that I was able to get, some of the very interesting uh, pyroclastic flows coming down virgin valleys and stuff like that, really incredible things. I'm in town. But his bravado soon gets him into serious danger. While driving north from the capital, Plymouth, the volcano erupts violently. When I looked up, I saw this tremendous black cloud coming across the sky, pitch black. The blast showers the southwest side of the island in a thick cloud of ash and mud. In a matter of seconds, day turns to night. Pitch black with lightning and thunder going everywhere around you, just striking everything on the roads, on the trees, on the houses. That was the, the most concerned I ever was for my life. It's high noon. But who would ever believe it? Can't see a thing. Can't see a thing. We're trapped in here. It'd be nice to get out of this area alive. 
14 minutes later, the ash cloud clears and David escapes. But the volcano still isn't finished. Another blast will hit this island paradise. Stay tuned for more seconds from disaster. On Sunday, January 20th, Dr. Brady Barr enters the world of the hippo. This is a really, really dangerous animal. By becoming one. I think I'm going to have my hands full. And he'll do it in a 200-pound hippo suit. I'm going to get inside the suit and approach them. In the middle of a swamp. He's looking right at me. At night. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. This is killing me. Dangerous Encounters Undercover Hippo premieres Sunday, January 20th at 9 on Nat Geo. I shall now read the last will and testament. The deceased leaves all of his money, property, and other valuables to Miss Jacqueline Monique Smith. Papa John's is celebrating 24 years of quality and giving you an order of cheese sticks free. Buy any large specialty pizza at regular price and get 14 delicious dippable cheese sticks free. So smile and say cheese. Free cheese sticks. Call or click PapaJohns.com today. Taste the difference. Better ingredients, better pizza. Papa John's. Yeah! I mean, sure. I help people save money on car insurance, but few folks know that I support wildlife conservation too. You're going to eat all those? Well, you are, aren't you? You're just going to go to town. All right, well, I'll make this quick. I'm teaming up with the association of zoos and aquariums. I'm going to be making the rounds to get the word out. Are those clams? I love clams. Do you uh, want to offer me any? Ah, uh, apparently not. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. today for the Gold Delta Sky Miles credit card from American Express and start earning double miles in more places more often. Apply now and get up to 20,000 bonus miles. With award tickets starting at just 25,000 miles, you can fly free sooner. Plus, the card is fee-free the first year. Call 1-877-890-AMEX. Call now for the Gold Delta Sky Miles credit card and earn two miles for every eligible dollar you spend for even faster travel awards on Delta and 15 airline partners. Take advantage of this great offer today and get 20,000 miles closer to a free trip. Plus, enjoy the card fee-free the first year. Apply online or call 1-877-890-AMEX now. They're sick, malnourished, and aggressive. Most of the dogs that I meet would have been euthanized. But in Dogtown, even animals like these are worth saving. Well, I don't know what her outcome would have been had we not gone there and saved her. With medical care and one-on-one -on -one training. We're pretty much allowed to do as much as we can to help these dogs. This unique facility Good gives boy. most dogs sanctuary and a chance to survive. When you kind of open up the dog's potential. Dogtown premieres Friday at 9 and 12 Eastern following The Dog Whisperer on Nat Geo. You're watching Seconds from Disaster. For nearly two years, volcanic activity on the Caribbean island of Montserrat has been escalating. Scientists observe the intensifying activity up close with anticipation. With the pressure growing, the British Geological Survey sends volcanologist Sue Lachlan to the site. A postgraduate from Durham University in Britain, Sue helps monitor the situation. I stepped out of the airport and looked up and there was this great big steaming volcano. Within minutes of arriving, I was watching pyroclastic flows coming down the flanks of the lava dome. So it was quite a, a sharp introduction to what was going on here. The lava dome has developed a pointed spire making it unstable. Magma is accumulating near the crater. 
scientists install tilt meters on the slopes to monitor the swelling and contraction of the dome. Pyroclastic flows most likely occur when the dome deflates. June 25th, 3 a.m. Seismometers at the observatory jumped to life. That night, David Lee and his son helped monitor them. I actually videoed the seismic machine that night, and these hybrid earthquakes were every 50 seconds. I remember saying to my son, you know, it looks like this thing's going to have a baby. It looks like it's birth pain. By 7 AM, the seismographs are still recording the activity. But the weather is bad, and little can be seen of the volcano through the wet fog. Scientists take to the air to monitor the activity closely. The imminent danger is broadcast to the islanders on the local radio station. All people inside the exclusion zone, including Bethel, Brahms Village, White Sea Yard, and Spanish Point should leave immediately. Delia Pond and her family are among several farmers who are tending their fields inside the exclusion zone. But Delia leaves her radio in the car and the mist conceals the mountain directly above her. She's unaware the volcano is about to blow. One minute, it's clear, and then it fogs over again. We can see the helicopter going overhead, but we cannot see the mountain. Near Delia's plot, Harry Lewis and his family are also working. Meanwhile, David Lee makes his way to a small hill north of the volcano to film the ash flows running down the valley. He immediately realizes the farmers are in danger. These people here are in about the worst place you could be because uh, the uh, pyroclastic flows would come over the top of that ridge there before they could even uh, probably get in their cars. Here they were in the field, and right above them in the valley, there were small pyroclastic flows coming down that same valley. 12.45 p.m. Seismographs at the observatory record a continuous tremor. In Plymouth, sirens are sounded, and the local radio station updates the community on the developing situation. Magma, rising rapidly inside the volcano, expands the lava dome to its final breaking point. Twelve fifty-five p.m. Soufriere Hills erupts. David Lee captures the enormous explosion on his camera. It was bigger than we'd ever seen before. And everybody was like, oh my god, they knew there were people in places they shouldn't be. I'm going to move out because it's way over our heads here. I just grabbed my camera and then made a mad dash around the entire island. And as you can see, we've had a major explosion. The eruption ejects an avalanche of superheated gas and rock cascading down a valley on the northern slopes. It heads towards the farmers still working in the fields. As Delia and her family prepare to leave, she opens the gate and catches sight of the white-hot avalanche bearing down on them. As I put my hand in the gate, it become a routine thing that I always look back at the mountain. And I just see the mountain almost halfway down coming at us. James, we have to go right now. Delia makes a conscious effort to keep calm. You're looking at something which is danger coming at you. I don't think it is wise to alarm the next person who would then turn around and cause a panic. But her husband James panics and immediately takes a left turn out of the gate, heading downhill. You need to go up there. As the volcanic wave gains ground, James fumbles with the gears. For some reason, he cannot get the car in reverse. And they need to get to higher ground. So then I have to say, all right, don't panic, take your time. Okay, okay. And I counted like one, one, 
Reverse. Suddenly, Harry Lewis drives toward them in search of his loved ones. In the panic, his family made a run for it. And in a bid to rescue them, he drives downhill into the path of the rolling inferno. We must get out of here. Delia and her family drive half a mile uphill, directly north of the volcano. They look back and see their fields engulfed in clouds of red-hot rock and ash. You're looking into Armageddon because you cannot see anything. Everything is just, just clouds, just clouds and smoke. In a village of Harris, almost two miles northeast of Soufriere Hills, Slim Daly is playing pool. He's unaware of the drama unfolding. But as the heat from the raging inferno reaches a gas station nearby, the gas ignites and the building explodes. We heard a noise. Immediately I realized something was desperately wrong. Slim sees the white hot avalanche cascading down the hill. He runs to his car and heads for higher ground. Then the darkness started to come over the road in front of me. And the heat, I started to feel the heat. At that point, I was, I was scared, not terrified. I was scared. On the hilltop, Slim watches the apocalyptic scene below. And looked at the pyroclastic flows destroying the whole village, the whole area, right down to very close to the airport. But as he watches, the volcanic wave changes direction. Now it's heading straight for him. Slim Daly will soon come face to face with the wrath of Soufrier Hills. Seconds from Disaster will continue on the National Geographic Channel. If you've tried more than once to quit smoking, you know it's a challenge that's not for sprinters. If only you could manage to stay on that quitting road. Discover Prescription Chantix. The Chantix approach is twofold. A non-nicotine pill with a program. The pill helps keep nicotine from reaching key receptors in the brain. It can effectively reduce that urge to smoke. And should you slip up, keep trying. Reach out for support. Tell your doctor which medicines you're taking, as they may work differently when you quit smoking. Chantix dosing may be different if you have kidney problems. Side effects may include nausea, trouble sleeping, changes in dreaming, constipation, gas, and vomiting. Studies show 44% were able to quit at the end of 12 weeks. So talk to your doctor about Chantix. It's all about getting there. How are you doing, Mom? I just can't believe Dad's gone. I'm just so glad you're home. What can I do to help? Oh, there's so much to do. But thankfully, your dad left some life insurance. Sounds like Dad. Always planning ahead. Now you can plan ahead and help make a trying time easier for your loved ones. Just call the toll-free number, and Physicians Life Insurance Company will send you this Final Wishes Planner free. This valuable guide lets you record all your personal information and final wishes in one convenient place, helping to save your family from a long and confusing search. While difficult to think about, the details in this planner can help ensure your wishes are known and help lift a burden from your family. Just as important, we'll also send you free information on the Guaranteed Life Insurance Policy. It offers you up to $10,000 of permanent modified whole life insurance designed to help your loved ones with the expenses they may face. If you're 45 to 80, your acceptance is guaranteed for one of these insurance policies. You won't have to take a medical exam or answer a single health question. Plus, your coverage can never be canceled because of your age or health. 
This is the kind of security we all want for our families. Guaranteed lifetime protection when it's needed most. So call this number to get your free information kit and final wishes planner directly by mail. There's no cost or obligation of any kind, and the final wishes planner is yours to keep no matter what. Remember, a little planning now can make a big difference for your loved ones later on. Call today. To get your free Final Wishes Planner and information kit direct by mail, call toll-free 1-800-749-2727. That's 1-800-749-2727. We're here when you need us, physicians, Sunday, he has no family history of obesity, works out, and still weighs over 500 pounds. Then, a 7-foot-8 giant. How did he get so big? This pea-sized organ. It all starts Sunday at 8 with Science of Obesity on Nat Geo. Bounty Hunters. He's running. He's running. It's a high-stakes game of hide-and-seek. Oh, my goodness. Where anything... We're coming in. You better come out. ...can happen. <laughs> Bounty Hunters. Cat and Mouse premieres Sunday, January 13th at 10, only on Nat Geo. Seconds from Disaster now continues on the National Geographic Channel. A catastrophic eruption rocks the volcanic island of Montserrat. Within minutes, a red-hot avalanche of rock and ash flows down Sioux Freer Hills, incinerating everything in its path. Islanders run for their lives, including Slim Daly. As Slim heads north, away from the volcano, he warns an elderly man of the imminent danger. It isn't long before they're overwhelmed by a dense, toxic cloud of hot ash and sulfurous gas. So you couldn't run because you couldn't see where you were going. Even if you put your hands to your face, it was impossible to see them. The heat makes it hard to breathe. So they drop to their knees for air. He kept on saying that we were going to die. <laughs> no, we're not going to die. Before. I tried to console him and, and said to him, no, 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 we're not going to die, we're not going to die. Meanwhile, survivors gather on a hill two and a half miles north of the airport. Scientist Rob Watts is among them. We could see this huge pyroclastic flow act literally uh, pulsing around the bend at the bottom of the mountain. A superheated tsunami of molten rock and ash stops 164 feet from the sea at the southern edge of the airstrip, just inside the exclusion zone. David Lee captures the scene on his camera. That's where the pyroclastic flow came to. By the time I got there, there were people coming from the north knowing that something had happened. But it was, it was something to see and knowing, all of us knowing, not who and not how many, but we knew that people had been, had been killed. 1.10 p.m., a daring helicopter rescue begins. Islanders, unable to escape by road, are stranded in villages northwest of the volcano. The chopper must fly dangerously close to the red-hot billowing ash cloud in order to reach them. One of the first rescues is made in Harris, where a small group of islanders are trapped. Miraculously, Slim Daly is among them. That thing came down like a bullet. He has flown to safety. By the end of the day, four people are confirmed dead. 17 others are missing. The islanders reel in shock fearing many more may have been killed. It was a day that shook all of Montserrat because it's a very small place and everybody's related to somebody and everybody knows everybody, so it was a very tough day. Immediately after the eruption, a team of scientists from the observatory explores why it exploded with such lethal energy. They gather eyewitness statements, photographic evidence, and data recorded from their instruments to build a comprehensive sequence of events. The eyewitnesses paint a disturbing picture. I saw it spreading and I, I see the way it fans out. It just bubbles up. 
Despite being aware of the dangers, the pyroclastic flow caught islanders within the exclusion zone by surprise. The sheer speed and scale of the avalanche was overwhelming. As it's coming towards you, it's like big stormy wave, but spreading out, it's spreading wider and wider. The combination of data recorded at the observatory, photographic evidence and eyewitness statements points to a complex sequence of blasts that created not one, but three pyroclastic flows, with each flow increasing in speed and intensity. Four days after the eruption, with activity in the volcano subsiding, the team gets their first glimpse into the crater. Although it's still hazardous, they fly over the summit of the mountain. What they see confirms their suspicions. The lava dome has collapsed over the north wall of the crater, down a valley known as Mosquito Gut. The ejected material covered one and a half miles of land, turning the north end and the east side of Soufrier Hills into a wasteland. The third and final pyroclastic flow traveled faster and spread further than the other two. It destroyed 150 homes. Using video footage and data recorded on the seismographs, the team calculates that the third flow reached speeds of up to 180 miles per hour. Islanders wouldn't have been able to escape from its path. To confirm this theory, the team needs to get on the ground. But the disaster zone is still too dangerous, and they have to wait for the ash and rock to cool. Back at the observatory, scientists analyzed data from the tilt meters that were tracking changes in the inflationary and deflationary cycle of the volcano. They provide an extraordinary insight. Just prior to the eruption, the lava dome expands massively, swelling over the north rim of the crater. Then, between 12.40 and 12.50 p.m., the volcano rapidly deflates. This destabilizes the outer layer of the dome. At 12.57, it collapses over the north crater wall, creating the first pyroclastic flow seen cascading down Mosquito Gut. Nearly three minutes later, more volcanic material deep inside the lava dome is ejected and a second, larger avalanche roars down the valley. 1.08 p.m., the third and most dangerous eruption catapults a column of ash 45,000 feet into the air, and a lethal mixture of red-hot debris flows down the northern slopes of the mountain. It's the most violent volcanic activity on the island in centuries. Several days after the eruption, it's safe for the team to enter the disaster zone on foot. As a precaution, they wear protective suits, since much of the ground is still extremely hot. By surveying the scar left in the lava dome and mapping the volume of the flow in the disaster zone, the scientists calculate nearly 14 million cubic feet of lava was ejected down the volcano. It's enough to fill Rome's Colosseum five and a half times. The scene is like a modern day Pompeii. The flows were over 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. 150 houses lie buried in 100 feet of volcanic rock and ash. Asphalt on the roads has melted. Wooden posts and doors have burst into flames. Windows have melted. The cooling lava flow reveals vital clues about the force of the third blast. Some of the blocks in the pyroclastic flow were enormous, bigger than a house. 
But one thing we did see on these blocks is friction marks. So it became clear that the blocks weren't rolling down the hill, they were bouncing so hard that they were actually partially melting. So you can imagine these enormous avalanches of bouncing, crashing boulders and rocks. But this scene holds the key to a deeper mystery. Why did the pyroclastic flow take so many by surprise? The islanders thought the ash and rock would stay within the valley, as it did in the preceding months. But they were wrong. After the first and second flows, the valley itself quickly filled with debris. The changing topography allowed the third, more violent flow to ride unimpeded over the path carved out by the other two. As it rampaged down the mountain, gathering momentum, it broke over the sides of the valley and traveled a total of four miles. What the farmers who had made these plans hadn't anticipated is that the topography that they were familiar with could change so very quickly. But further investigation of the disaster zone presents the team with a phenomenon rarely witnessed. Above and beyond the destruction left by the heavy deposits of the flow, they find signs of severe scorching spreading out across the plains of Farrell's yard. It's evidence of a pyroclastic surge. As the flow's rock and ash cascade down the mountainside, the rock breaks apart, releasing superheated volcanic gases. This gas rapidly expands and acts as a white-hot hurricane, riding over the heavier debris of the flow itself and burning everything in its path. It had melted windows, it had melted paint, it had twisted vegetation um, and fence posts, um, it had melted roofing tiles. The surge reached temperatures up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit and traveled over 80 miles per hour. But it had another deadly attribute. It behaved in an unpredictable manner. Pyroclastic flows uh, tend to remain in valleys. However, the surge above that can detach from the avalanche. Um, particularly, it bends in the valley. Halfway down the mountain, the valley makes a distinctive change in direction. As the surge hit this bend, instead of turning, it detached from the pyroclastic flow and headed straight across the farming plains of Farrell's yard. This explains the final mystery. Days after the disaster, the bodies of Harry Lewis's family are discovered. All three were fatally burned, yet they were well beyond the clutches of the pyroclastic flow. Expecting high ground to provide safety, they ran to a small hill just north of where they were farming. But the pyroclastic surge outpaced them. People thought they could outrun it. People thought they could go uphill to avoid it, but that wasn't the case. The momentum that it builds up coming downhill enabled it to travel uphill. So cars, vehicles, trees can all be moved by pyroclastic surges. In the intense heat of the surge, the body suffers a neurogenic shock and the nervous system shuts down. Death is almost instantaneous. In total, 19 people lose their lives in the disaster. Yet despite this tragedy, it's amazing many more didn't perish. The scale of the eruption and the devastation caused by its pyroclastic flows took the islanders by surprise. But 10 years earlier, this man predicted a similar scenario. Professor Jeff Wodge worked at the University of West Indies Seismic Research Unit. In 1986, he and his colleague Michael Isaacs were commissioned by the United Nations to assess the risks posed by the Montserrat volcano. 
Over 70% of the 40,000 people killed by pyroclastic flows in the last century have occurred in the Lesser Antilles, the string of Caribbean islands that includes Montserrat. Their research was designed to help the island's government make contingency plans in the event of an eruption. Wodge visited the authorities with an update on his report. I told them what I was doing. I told them that I would be preparing a report on the likely future behavior of the volcano. I did that, submitted my report, uh, expecting them to take some notice of it. Professor Wodge and his colleague predicted that Soufriere Hills could erupt with serious consequences, and they advised moving Montserrat's infrastructure to the north of the island. But the government never acted upon their advice. Stay tuned for the conclusion of Seconds from Disaster. On Sunday, January 20th, Dr. Brady Barr enters the world of the hippo. This is a really, really dangerous animal. By becoming one. I think I'm going to have my hands full. Of and he'll do it in a 200-pound hippo suit. I'm going to get inside the suit and approach them. In the middle of a swamp. He's looking right at me. At night. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. This is killing me. Dangerous Encounters Undercover Hippo premieres Sunday, January 20th at 9 on Nat Geo. Stay tuned for an amazing free stop smoking offer. We quit smoking together. I don't think I could stop without it. I quit just like that. No matter how much you smoke, no matter how long you've been smoking, with Maximum Strength Cigarettes, you will quit, guaranteed. Two packs a day for 20 years, and I'm a non smoker now. Cigarettes was easy, it just worked. All Natural Cigarest has helped over 4 million customers and has been proven to help you break the smoking habit without the withdrawals of going cold turkey. I thought I was going to go nuts wanting a cigarette. I never did. It was wonderful. Cigarettes took the cravings away and I just didn't need to smoke anymore. I tried them all, but cigarettes worked. Other stop smoking methods can eventually cost you hundreds of dollars and they're not even guaranteed to work. But we're so sure cigarettes will work for you, we'll let you try it free. You get a 30-day supply of Maximum Strength Cigarest, the proven behavior-modifying technique CD, and step-by-step -step success guides, a $39.95 value, free. Plus, to stop the cravings instantly, we'll include a free 30-day supply of minty anti-craving gum. And because smoking depletes your body's natural vitamin reserve, we'll also send along a 30-day supply of Cigarest VitaGuard High-Potency Smokers Vitamins. That's almost $100 of proven stop-smoking power, free of charge. I did it for the family. The kids wanted me to stop smoking. Hey, do what I did. Pick up the phone and call his toll-free number. Except no substitutes. Cigarest is the easy way to stop smoking once and for all. Order the product guaranteed to break your cigarette habit. Cigarest. Call toll-free at 1-800-850-3500. That's 1-800-850-3500 to order your free 30-day supply of cigarettes, your free 30-day supply of high-potency smoker's vitamins, and your free 30-day supply of anti-craving gum. That's 1-800-850-3500. Credit card required for shipping and handling. Call now at 1-800-850-3500. <laughs> Are the credit card bills closing in on you? Shouldn't this be the year you get a fresh start? Well, now you can settle your debts with dignity and without bankruptcy. Get the professional help of the Debt Reduction Law Center and get a fresh start. I just sign up. They do all the real work. The Debt Reduction Law Center uses the power of legal professionals to settle your debts. We'll get you an affordable monthly payment. And settle your debt so you'll have hundreds more each month. For a free consultation, call 800-569-6142. Call now. They're sick, malnourished, and aggressive. But in Dogtown, even animals like these are worth saving. Well, I don't know what her outcome would have been had we not gone there and saved her. With medical care and one-on-one -on -one training, this facility gives most dogs a chance to survive. Dogtown premieres Friday at 9 and 12 Eastern following The Dog Whisperer on Nat Geo.
And now the conclusion of seconds from disaster. Soufriere Hills on the island of Montserrat has erupted violently, killing 19 islanders. But could more have been done to avoid this tragedy? In the inquest that followed, the jury blamed the deaths on the government, failing to provide adequate infrastructure and farmland for the displaced islanders. But 10 years earlier, Professor Wadge and his colleague Michael Isaacs had advised moving much of Montserrat's infrastructure to the north of the island. They insisted Sioux Freer Hills be regarded as an active volcano. Although it hadn't erupted for centuries, it displayed seismic activity in the form of earthquakes. These quakes occurred most recently in the 1930s and again in the 1960s. This was evidence of the volcano trying, but failing, to erupt once every 30 years. Watch predicted that a potentially catastrophic eruption might occur in the mid-1990s, three decades after the last intense seismic activity. The report gave details of several different scenarios. It could range from a relatively uh, small eruption that was contained within the crater to one that would then spill out of the crater and threaten the slopes of Plymouth. But forecasting volcanic eruptions is an imperfect science, and Wadge was only able to attach a 1% chance to his prediction. Faced with such odds, the government failed to act. But 10 years after the report was published, the professor's predictions came true. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day, we can explain why and how 19 Islanders died. June 25, 1997. 10 hours to disaster. Volatile magma rises rapidly up the magma chamber deep inside the volcano. It places the lava dome under pressure, causing it to inflate and deflate continuously. Seven hours to disaster. Local farmers, including Delia Pond and her family, drive through checkpoints into the exclusion zone. 11 minutes to disaster. The first volcanic eruption occurs. The outer part of the lava dome collapses, and a pyroclastic flow cascades over the northern wall of the crater. Eight minutes to disaster. A second eruption occurs, and a larger avalanche of rock and ash pours down the same valley. 1.08 p.m. A third massive eruption sends more volatile material racing down the volcano. It spills over the valley walls at 80 miles per hour. A pyroclastic surge breaks away from the flow and spreads across farmland. It sweeps through three villages, killing seven people. Heavy debris continues down Mosquito Gut, destroying more villages and claiming 12 more lives. In just 25 minutes, 19 islanders are dead. We made a calculated risk, and I just have to give thanks to the Almighty we survive. One month later, with the island still reeling from the disaster, one of Professor Wadge's more extreme scenarios comes true. Sioux Friere Hills blasts another pyroclastic flow down its slopes. It hits the abandoned town of Plymouth and completely destroys it. There was no loss of life, but it could have been a much different scenario. Had the volcano erupted this violently initially, it could have killed thousands. Sioux Friere Hills has been active for more than 10 years. Today, 4,500 islanders still live on Montserrat, including Delia Pond, 
Slim Daly, and David Lee. But they're cornered in the north of this Caribbean paradise. Half of Montserrat is uninhabitable and is expected to remain so for a decade. 